Hello everyone, my name is Madalina Armi and today I'm going to present being an insider and an outsider home in Evelyn Collins, escaping the Celtic Tiger, World Music and the Millennium, belonging to the collection telling new and selected stories. Whether temporary, permanent, individual or collective, or love such choice or a compulsory prospect, emigration is frequently associated with feelings of loss and nostalgia caused by the prospects of departure and separation. Emigration has always been perceived by the Irish themselves as the Irish solution for many of the Irish problems, such as scarcity of land, unemployment, illegitimacy, social entrapment, etc. Emigration, therefore, is one of the most important forces that transform and continues to model the shape of the country and demography. Then it is impossible to understand the territory's history and contemporary culture, society, or literature without a far reaching knowledge of this aspect. The 1990s has witnessed for the first time in the island's history the disposal of the former label of emigrant country, but also the challenging of the hard held idea of the Republic's mono ethnic makeup, as this was transforming into a multicultural society due to the inflow coming from Africa, Asia, North and South America, Eastern and Central Europe. The extent and the speed of the phenomenon was such that between 1995 and 2000, about a quarter of a million people moved to Ireland. One of these people is Anne Marie, an Irish retourner and the protagonist of the short story Escape in the Celtic Tiger, World Music and the Millennium by Evelyn Conlon, herself an emigrant for many years. Conlon's piece of short fiction presents the limitations of both past and present discourses of the Irish nation related to these historical episodes of emigration and immigration. Moreover, by dissecting both the story questions identity formation in the context of an imaginative community which emerged during the early years of the Republic and which embody a highly restricted notion of citizenship and ethnicity, which despite undergoing significant modifications during the Celtic Tiger boom, has remained as essentially exclusionary. Directly derived from this discussion here is the old and recognised Irish tradition of shaping, limiting and creating boundaries that help to understand, explain, sometimes in contraposition, sometimes in similarity to the other, whoever this might be, a woman, a member of a sexual or ethnic community, a native retourne or a non-native immigrant. In view of the heterogeneity and hybridity that define global societies, Nowadays and more than ever, there is a real and urgent need of the promotion of increasingly diverse and new forms of understanding human interconnectedness, but also recognizing the necessity of a different rereading and reinterpretation of history and rigid social cultural constructs such as, for example, womanhood, Irishness, home, mother island and nation. Special consideration must be then here offered to the language of postmodern theory, which is replete with references to space and movement and to concepts such as, for example, nomadism, fluidity of boundaries and border crossing, at a time when, when to be an emigre or to belong to the diaspora is perceived as nothing but a marketable millennial culture currency, which recasts our recurrent homelessness as an asset rather than as a deficit. By virtue of the value of these late motives that enable the rereading of this piece of short fiction along this essay, the diasporic identity becomes an alternative to the metaphysic of race, nation, and bounded culture coded into the body. And diaspora is the concept that promulgates the culture and historical mechanisms of belonging. It disrupts the fundamental power of territory to determine identity by breaking the simple sequences of explanatory links between place location and consciousness. It destroys the native invocation of common memory as the basis of particularity. Interesting is therefore here to consider how literature and by extension this short story help to understand how people build identities and how do they use them within and with outside communities where otherness works at several levels. Escaping the Celtic Tiger, World Music and the Millennium, then is a satirical cross-section of the Cel Irish Celtic Republic in the middle of its booming economic expansion, initiated at the dawn of the 20th century, centered around the observation of the diasporic identity, while reflecting on Irish ideals and ideas of belonging, but also stereotypes in relation to womanhood. 
The plot, although set in the now and here, can be read historically, and it presents a precarious economic and social position of Anne Marie and her invisibility during the Celtic Tiger period. And that, with realism, the author explores the identical crisis faced by the protagonist once she's back to Ireland, where Anne Marie becomes the alienated author in a country that has broke the chains between memory, place, and location, and it no longer resembles the former idea of home. Despite success, Ireland is still a country with an unfertile ground in which Anne Marie can personally grow. In this context, then, women's claimed disability achieved to the Celtic Tiger's success and changes occurring in the 1990s is questioned through the character of Anne Marie, and is critically observed how her experiences represent a continuation of a tradition unfolding throughout centuries rather than a true change. Despite the glorification of the Irish woman, her reality lies in the shadow of official history. It was culturally and largely taken for granted that women and children were secondary and passive characters in this process as they immigrated just to accompany their male counterparts, the breadwinners of the family unit. Contrary to the popular belief, men were at times outnumbered by women. With the ties of the land of Ireland shaken loose by the famine, many single women became the most mobile part of this population, ready to fill in the massive gaps in the rapidly industrializing labor forces, working in the domestic service, textile industry, healthcare, or teaching in countries such as England, America, or Australia. One of these women is Anne Marie, the protagonist of this short story, a retourne who decided to depart Ireland and who now, attracted by the promising prospects of the ephemeral prosperity of the Celtic Tiger, decides to go back to the end of the 1990s after wandering around the world and working in the service industry. Her life as a woman on the move was largely a good one, although it was demanding considered the type of work she was forced to do. Quickly, the reader learns that this Performed tasks were far from her dream job when it is claimed humorously that during her childhood she wanted to be a tire siege, and later in the hardwood that her job she really wanted was to flag landing planes. Amusingly, Anne Marie had always had rare aspiration regarding her future, as she had dreamt about becoming a nun, a priest, a mother, a nurse, and finally a sailor. The mentioning of these jobs, which are gendered occupation in the island of the past, is nothing but Conlon's critique for Irish women's equalisation with the idea of modern Ireland and a condemnation to passiveness and paralysis through their objectification and limitation of the working options and confined to the domestic sphere. The constant clashes over issues such as abortion, contraception and divorce along history halted the existence of rooted traditional ideals forged by the Catholic Church and the Irish state, which enabled the creation of this restrictive and patriarchy dominated space where women were conceptualized simplistically are only as daughters, mothers and wives. This vision of womanhood in the Irish territory produced constant clashes and helped to perpetuate a unique set of values which was evidently far from the dreams and reality of the Irish real women. Anne-Marie, at an already tender age, is perpetrated cautiously, although unconsciously, presenting the only available and respectable options for the Irish woman, that is to embrace her religious life, to become a mother, or finally to achieve certain economic independence by becoming a nurse, while allowing men to attain important and powerful positions such as being priests, doctors, or presidents. Despite the fact that the reasons which motivate the young woman departure are not exposed, the seeds for living and traveling the world are already sown in the girl with, when she dreams of becoming a sailor. Along her travels, Anne-Marie is enriched emotionally, and her suitcase becomes her life, a life not anchored but spared in the multiplacedness of home, allegorically mirrored by the images of the sea and the ship. Secure or not, the ship connected for centuries Ireland and its people to the world and propitiated the creation of new hybrid cultures. Anne-Marie achieves this hybrid and dynamic way of life helped by her adaptive personality. Nonetheless, 
She is physically connected to a place of origin, and at a certain moment during one of her exotic escapades, she feels homesick. Then, advised by her friend the Catholic, she plans her journey back to Ireland, hoping to find her home suspended in time, but paradoxically free from danger. In Ireland, these ideas of home and displacement have been frequently brought into question as they lie at the very heart of emigration. Therefore, Ireland is experienced as home at several scales, most frequently as family space at the household level, as a neighbourhood peopled by kin and neighbours, and as a national space. In the past, the sense of safeness of home has been threatened by various factors, as colonised people have not known their homelands as safe, stable places, but have experienced invasion by imperial force and even been displaced by slavery and voluntary immigration. In Ireland, therefore, historically the idea of home has not been one to be taken for granted because of painful memories, and as a matter of fact, Anne-Marie understands both concepts, home and countries, in terms of instability, poverty and misery. For the country to become secure, major changes had to occur. With violence here is related to the north and troubles which have marred the childhood and adolescence of the young Anne-Marie, who conceives emigration to the United States as a way to escape from the chaotic situation, endless commemorations and mass shootings. Anne-Marie's visit back to Ireland coincides also with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in 1998, Although, curiously, this is not mentioned among the elements which drive the protagonist crazy, enumerating the title of the short story. A possible interpretation for this is Irish society's concern with their economic growth, while the pacification of the northern conflict becomes just a background noise in the Republic's frenetic race towards globalization. Regarding the economic aspects, England has never known better times, although once in her town, Anne-Marie discovers that while not the local may be familiar, everything from finding a house to driving a car can be different from when she left. As time passes, Anne-Marie's memories become increasingly detached from the contemporary character of the places she knew as a child. She is transformed into an outsider during her absence from this place which now resembles secretly whichever developed country she has visited before. Anne-Marie observes how women behaviour has changed, being now concerned with their appearance and spending their money on looking good, while others manifest openly their sexuality and bodily desires. The protagonist sees herself forced to adapt to the pretensions of this cosmopolitan island, and a good starting point would be changing her outmoded language, otherwise she would have to flee again, and this time she was trying to plant her feet for a while to see what would sprout. But everyone speaks about Ireland's boom, even in Hawks Pub, and she experiences the panic of no belonging, of being outside by words, as she overhears the first time a man and a woman mentioning the Celtic tiger. Language and words become overwhelming, not only because of the constant and almost compulsive repetition here, but also because they represent symbolically her alienation, the feelings of displacement in this rebranded idea of home. Part of a runaway generation, Anne-Marie observes how this whole new island of the new millennium, which under the surface resembles a lot that of the past, is believed to be the project of those who were left behind, those Irish people who stay at home and make the Celtic target prosperity function. Anne-Marie perceives the disdain and hostility of her people, as if only by emigrating her life was one of luxury, success and success. Her story of the borders of Ireland is not recalled, although, considering the narrator's allusions to Ireland's traumatic historical legacies, her experience as an emigrant was not exactly a path strewn with roses either. Emigration and its causes have always been read in relation to the Great Famine and directly corrected to the repercussions of the British colonialism. Nonetheless, as time passed and independence was achieved, the chronic emigration of the 1950s and the 1980s could not be blamed on or associated with Britain, but to a series of internal, economical, environmental, social and political factors. 
As a matter of fact, Anne-Marie is part of one of these two generations, that of the 1980s, and she was forced to emigrate, but her contributions bear inestimable importance to the construction of an idea of being Irish under the country's culture and economic growth. With this, Anne-Marie's posture in her society is vindicated, valued by the author who leaves a categorical message without the money and sacrifice of Irish emigrants, this island of the Celtic Tiger would not have been possible. Anne-Marie's necessity to, to leave home again is presented from the very beginning in the title of the short story, while the denouncement exposes her inabilities to settle there. There is a warm vision of her suitcase and some of her wishes to find a new desert which to put her heart in, where she can enjoy her freedom are very clear clearly mentioned. Anne-Marie's understanding of the notion of home then fits perfectly to the idea of diasporic identity in relation to place and no limits. It implies places of belonging at different scales from the global to the local. Some aspects of belonging are actively chosen by women to express the feelings or identity, but others are imposed on her by construction of her gender positioning in society. Home is implicit, a necessary counterpart rather than a binary opposite. What is more, Anne-Marie is unable to get married and feed in her assign a role of wife and future mother in this so-called global island. For the decision to reject marriage, Anne-Marie becomes a transgressor of her patriarchal society. Therefore, here is where Connor's narrative it builds bridges together between the Irish woman of the past and Irish woman of the present, bringing differences and limits together while more positive experience of immigration is offered. In this new context, Irish women and immigrants are studied from new perspectives and this is a stable national and social construct. Considering all these premises, this story brings to the forefront a real necessity of data version of women food that must be provided from the academia and the arts, especially now when the weight of multiculturalism and inclusiveness pushes it forward to the need to expand definitions in order to accommodate both the emigrant and the immigrant women. An interesting question could be asked, therefore, if a native Irish woman as Anne-Marie feels this way in her society, how could a new comer feel? If even leaving Ireland for a few years has meant returning emigrants find an Ireland different and change utterly and a counter compatriots rejection and feeling of otherness, the position of the immigrant is therefore here more alienated. Contrasts and limits have been explored here all along this paper through stereotypes, womanhood, emigration and immigration, and all of them allow modern Ireland to hold a mirror to itself and see blemishes and all its own bare face.